Okay, hi. Uh, we're going to talk about atherosclerosis. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, please watch the atherosclerosis part one first. It'll give a lot of introductory material that'll help for understanding this. Um, question, why study atherosclerosis? Because it'll kill you if you don't. Atherosclerosis is not only the most common cause of death, myocardial infarction, at about 26%. It also causes the majority of strokes, causes the majority of dementia, and it causes all kinds of other problems. Blindness, hearing loss, kidney failure. You know, every part of the body needs blood flow. And atherosclerosis, it's a systemic disease. It goes everywhere. And it, I think a lot of these old people have what I would call total body ischemia. And it just damages all their organ systems and takes a lot of their energy away from them. So, and the good news is it's very easy to prevent once you understand it. There's just a few concepts and you can avoid it. Whereas most people, they have no idea what's going on and just all kinds of things happen to them and they just attribute it to bad luck and aging. But really most of the stuff is preventable. There's lots of populations that don't get this almost at all. Okay, we're just going to have a quick quote from Cicero, the greatest of the Romans. Cicero said, to be a man, you must study history. To not know what happened before you were born is to forever remain a child. Marcus Tullius Cicero, from 100 to 43 BC, he lived. And as this relates to health, to optimize health, you must study atherosclerosis. To not know how to prevent atherosclerosis is to forever remain a chump. I see tons and tons of people. They never get better. They just, you know, deteriorate, and it's real sad. And they have no sense of their health being their own responsibility. You have to learn about this stuff. Nobody can save you. You have to save yourself. And the good news is pretty straightforward on what to do. You just need to know it and do it. Atherosclerosis is easy to prevent, and I have sort of make up this little saying that there's such a thing as I would call health aristocrats. A health aristocrat is somebody who studies health and, you know, how should one eat? How should one exercise? How should one handle sleep? How should one handle avoiding estrogenic chemicals, okay? Whereas what most people do, they just imitate whoever's around them, and the person around them probably doesn't know either, and they both end up fat and sick and cognitively impaired. Okay, so this is an illustration from some book booklet I wrote years ago. Uh, Big food, let my people go. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some theories of atherosclerosis. The one that most people have heard of is cholesterol theory. And this is especially as relates to LDL cholesterol. Ansel Keys, you know, first came along after World War II, and he saw that the you know, well-nourished businessmen types had a lot more atherosclerosis than relatively poor or slightly malnourished persons. And then he started comparing different countries, a seven-country study, and seeing that there's a strong association with cholesterol and coronary artery disease. Um, other persons that are listed here. And there's a lot of usefulness to the cholesterol theory. Um, my only point I'm going to make with this talk is it's just a subset of the causes of atherosclerosis. It doesn't explain everything. Many people um, have thought that atherosclerosis and cholesterol, that's all there is to it. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. But certainly cholesterol is the most common risk factor for most people. Okay, the next thing is the vasovasorum theory. It especially comes from a cardiac surgeon, Dr. Axel Haverich. He wrote a pretty nice book. I liked his book. Here it is. Atherogenesis, Pathogenesis, and Microvascular Dysfunction. It's good, but I think it's just a corner of it. He thinks it's the most important thing. And I do think it's important, but it's not the most important thing. Bacterial theory, I think, is kind of a joke. They find bacterial plaques in, in some uh, bacteria in atherosclerotic plaques. But, you, you know, Esselstyn put all the patients on a vegan diet and they got better. He didn't have to give them any antibiotics. Then the other thing you're going to hear a lot about is inf inflammation theory. And there's something to it. But basically, here's the big secret. Atherosclerosis is a blood clot. And when blood clots in the body, the body then tries to reabsorb it. The immune system comes in and tries to clean it up. And I think that's the main component of inflammation in atherosclerosis. Um, the way the inflammation theory proponents approach atherosclerosis is they divide it into two parts. The hyperlipidemia aspect from cholesterol and high triglycerides, which can be treated, for example, with medicines to reduce those things. And then the inflammatory component, in particular, as relates to CRP, C-reactive protein. 
um, as an indicator of inflammation, a marker of inflammation. Okay, so um, next theory we'll briefly mention here is protective adaptation theory. So this comes out of Cho, who was an engineering guy, and Kenzie was a cardiologist. And the gist of it is, once you lose ascending thoracic aorta wind kessel effect from a loss of elastic fibers, you lose the elastic recoil in diastole cardiac relaxation, and you can't maintain good diastolic flow, and then you have a higher systolic pressure, the contraction phase of the left ventricle, leading to high, um, the first number, systolic number in blood pressure, and that that high pressure injures arterial walls, and the arterial walls compensate by thickening, and the entire process leads to atherosclerosis. And there is some truth to that. That's one of the reasons why you want to treat hypertension or prevent it as soon as you can, because the longer you have the hypertension, the more likely it is to damage arterial walls and you know, cause more thickening and scouring in your smaller arteries, arterioles, and make the hypertension more difficult to reverse. Okay, then we're gonna talk about atherothrombosis theory. And atherothrombosis theory is really the most important thing you can know about atherosclerosis along with the cholesterol stuff because once you understand atherothrombosis theory, you can, you can explain almost everything in atherosclerosis. Um, and it's been around a long time. It's been around longer than cholesterol theory. The first pathologists that were looking at atherosclerosis in a serious way like Carl von Rokotansky in the mid 1800s, you look at it under a microscope, Atherosclerosis looks like a blood clot. John Duguid, it's hard to pronounce his name, mid-1900s, same thing. All of these big names in atherothrombosis research, they're all pathologists, because when you look at it under a microscope, it looks like a blood clot. So that'll end up explaining a lot of stuff about atherosclerosis. Okay, a few words on inflammation theory. Uh, when I look at CTA stands for like a CAT scan, computerized tomography, you just call them CT scans, and then the A for angiography, so that would be called CT angiography is the CTA. I look at tons of these, and I can tell you atherosclerosis does not look like inflammation. It looks like a blood clot. It's the same density as a blood clot. And when you have a round lumen, it's not everywhere in the artery. It's just on one part. Let me see if I can get lined up correctly. It's just in one part of the vessel, you know, like let's say here might be a better circle and it's just on one side of it primarily. It'll eventually sometimes become circumferential, but most of the time it's eccentric, meaning to one side. Also, when you see an infection, or let's say if you had an infection, like a vasculitic infection of an arterial wall, it typically would be circumferential. In addition, with an infection, you'll get stranding in the fat adjacent to the infection. There's typically a gradation of severity with an infection, not atherosclerosis. And the same patient will get a scan one day, get a scan a day later, a week later, a month later, six months later, a year later, it looks the same. You know, real inflammatory processes and real infections are usually progressing. They're getting better, getting worse, a lot of change. And like I said, they're circumferential. Okay, um, the C-reactive protein bump up is so small, you need a high sensitivity CRP test to detect it you know, in the ballpark of a two or a three on your CRP. Whereas with a more serious infection or inflammatory process, you'll have much higher CRPs. And the pathologist, Dr. Gregory Sloop, who's probably the best atherosclerosis researcher in the world at this time, he says he calls it pseudo-inflammation. And the other pathologists will tell you the same thing. William C. Roberts, probably the greatest um, cardiac pathologist in the world, he'll say that you look under a microscope, you don't see that much inflammation. You see some macrophages. There's residential macrophages that live in the subendothelial space, that can absorb some fat and become a foam cell. Those residential macrophages are often called dendritic uh, cells because they've got processes that'll extend out that increase their surface area for sampling the environment. Um, and they can just become foam cells, okay? Meaning that they ingest uh, fat and lipid. Um, it doesn't necessarily imply there's this inward migration of WBCs, white blood cells, and this big inflammatory response, because there isn't. Um, next thing, uh, looking at it under a microscope, it looks like organizing thrombus, means that a thrombus, once it occurs, or a blood clot, one, a thrombus and blood clot are the same thing, it'll gradually get reabsorbed by the body and there'll be a laying down of collagen, fibrotic tissue, scar tissue, and also calcification. There's not that many inflammatory cells. Um, you can read that clearly in the work of Sloop and Roberts, and both of these guys are super smart, and they've been studying atherosclerosis all their lives. These, they know what they're talking about. Elevated CRP requires, like I said, high sensitivity assay, uh, CRP with atherosclerosis plaque is thought to be more of a myokine. What the atherothrombosis group believes is that because the muscles are becoming depleted of their glycogen, that they release signaling chemicals called myokines, in particular 
interleukin-6, IL-6, that it goes to the liver and then it causes an increase in uh, CRP. That's the theory that they believe based on their research and experience. And if you think about it, we talked about it before in, in lectures about lipids um, that, in particular like my lectures on hypertension, that when you get a low formation and after a high fat meal you're going to drop the rate of perfusion of the tissues plus you're going to end up with uh, insulin resistance due to the high fat getting into the skeletal muscle cell more rapidly and inducing uh, dysfunction in electron transport within the inner mitochondrial membrane. So the point of all that is fatty food leads to a depletion of muscle glycogen and it doesn't have to be inflammation it just CRP can go up just from that. And what the pathologist will tell you is inflammation in their opinion should not be defined based on a blood test. In their opinion, inflammation should be defined on looking at a microscope at the tissue of interest and do you see an inflammatory process there? And according to Dr. Sloop and Roberts, no, not really. Just, you know, reabsorption of a hematoma. That's their opinion. Okay, next thing, inflammatory theory continued. Um, it's also been shown by Kempner, Pritikin, Ornish, and Esselstyn that atherosclerosis can be halted or reversed with dietary change. And the fact that you can control it by changing diet is a good indicator that the high meat, high oil, high fat diet is what causes it. In addition, if it was primarily inflammatory, why does it get worse with a very powerful anti-inflammatory uh, medication or drug or stress or whatever like corticosteroids and a lot of other anti-inflammatories. Okay, um, immune cells, the small amount that are in the region of the atherosclerotic plaque are there to clean up the hematoma. Inflammatory theory cannot explain lots of things about atherosclerosis, whereas you're going to see that atherothrombosis theory does explain uh, most of the issues in, ather in um, atherosclerosis. And Atherothrombosis theory includes what's called hemorrheology, you know, the movement and shape of the red blood cells, and blood viscosity refers to the thickness of the red blood cells. Okay, so some points about trying to attribute atherosclerosis just to lipid. Lipid and fat mean the same thing. You can't explain all kinds of important things. You can't explain why does it get worse with aging? Uh, why is hypertension such an important cause of atherosclerosis? What about sickle cell anemia? You know, kids have myocardial infarctions and strokes with sickle cell anemia, and that's their only risk factor, normal cholesterol. Why do premenopausal women almost never uh, have a myocardial infarction? Because menstruation is the equivalent of a therapeutic phlebotomy every month, which lowers their hematocrit, and therefore it lowers their blood viscosity, makes their blood less thick, so their blood pressure is lower. And when red blood cells first come out of the bone marrow, they're more flexible. It's thought, you know, a typical red blood cell lives about 120 days, and as time goes by, there's a progressively higher percent that are glycated, and that glycation stiffens their uh, plasma cell membranes and leads them to have a more difficult time passing through a capillary. Typical red blood cell is about 7 microns in diameter. Capillary is about 5 microns, so a red blood cell has to deform to get through that capillary. Um, so the stiffer its plasma membrane, the more difficult that is, pressure has to go up. Uh, hysterectomy, you know, one has to be careful about hysterectomy. A lot of people think hysterectomy is no big deal. When a woman gets a hysterectomy before the age of 35, she loses that monthly therapeutic phlebotomy, and she now assumes essentially about the same risk factors as a man for atherosclerosis. Lots of guys have atherosclerosis problems in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. The arteries up to the brain, uh, carotid arteries, internal carotids, they're about 6 millimeters in diameter. The arteries in the heart, they're about half that. 3 millimeters in diameter, the coronaries approximately, and then down to the Johnson, the pudendal artery is only about 1.5 millimeter. And the point is a 1.5 millimeter pudendal artery, it doesn't take a lot of atherosclerosis to plug that up, including there's even more distal arteries. And so what am I saying is, it's been said about 30% of men in their 30s have impotence, 40% in their 40s, 50% in their 50s, 60% in their 60s. It's pretty common. With a high fat diet, it's common. So, and once you've occluded severely stenosed or occluded, narrowed um, those arteries to the Johnson, it's a very good indicator that the same thing is happening in the coronaries because it's really the same disease most of the time. And um, so it's a warning that you're headed for you know, coronary artery disease. And you want to prevent coronary artery disease because coronary artery disease will prevent with sudden death. So it's real easy to prevent, but you just have to know what to do. Um, 
the reason men have more coronary events at a younger age and more atherosclerosis is because they don't menstruate. Um, the re another example of how high hematocrit can be so dangerous, look at the Tour de France bicyclists that were taking the Epoetin to get their hematocrit up. So that, that's a useful medicine to raise hematocrit when a person needs it, but when it's being abused for the bicyclists, they have those high hematocrits, they increase their risk of a myocardial infarction. So they're cranking away on the bicycle, they need a high blood volume, it dilutes their blood a little bit, they get more oxygen carrying capacity, but when they're sitting around and their blood volume goes down, now they got this really thick blood that can thrombose their coronaries. When a person has a splenectomy, the spleen normally is like the graveyard, okay, for the red blood cells. It gets rid of them in about 120 days, and um, it clears out the stiff ones because they have to pass through almost like a, a strainer, and the older, stiffer ones can't do it, and they break apart, and they're ingested by, liver, by spleen macrophages. So what am I saying is when a person has a splenectomy, let's say for trauma, now that they're increased risk for atherosclerosis because they got more stiff old RBCs floating around in their blood. Okay, um, hyper, hypercoagulability of any reason will increase the risk of atherosclerosis, you know, myocardial infarction and stroke. Okay, what about fatty streak? You're going to hear that fatty streak is the key precursor lesion, and they're going to try to scare you saying, oh, fatty streak occurs in children and teenagers. I don't think they're the same thing. They're, they're two different things. The lipids in fatty streak are different than the lipids in a atherosclerotic plaque. In an atherosclerotic plaque, the lipids are related to the red blood cell plasma membrane at breaking apart. And um, same thing with the cholesterol crystals come from that. Whereas fatty streak, they're just from the blood cholesterol. And so they're two separate things. And fatty streak can just be ingestion by the residential macrophages and dendritic cells through penocytosis, for example. So I just say that because it helps you to understand the mechanism. So you don't really start getting atherosclerosis. You know, how many of you heard, other than a sickle cell anemia type situation, of a people having myocardial infarctions at a younger age than that? What happens is, yeah, the Winkessel effect, um, ascending thoracic aorta elastic fibers can't be replaced after adult maturity, about 20 to 23 years of age. And then that's when people progressively lose their Winkessel effect, develop hypertension, and start developing atherosclerosis. You don't tend to get atherosclerosis in the typical person unless they've had some high blood pressure and they have high lipids. Um, okay. A couple things on the cause of atherosclerosis. Increased sodium leads to increased cytoplasm calcium. We talked about this a lot in the lectures on hypertension. And then you get decreased nitric oxide production from the endothelial cells, the lining cells of the arteries, you get vasoconstriction, high blood pressure. Okay, high blood pressure damages arteries, leads to atherosclerosis. Um, a lot of people eating a lot of meat, oils, and uh, junk food, fast food, processed food, excuse me. And those are depleted of potassium and magnesium, things that you really need. Potassium and magnesium come from plants, they're vasodilators, they open up arteries. Good health is largely keeping your arteries open. Good healing is largely having good blood supply to whatever you're trying to heal. <clears throat> Saturated fat um, causes a red blood cell reload formation. Reload means stack of coins in French, meaning that it sticks all the red blood cells together. Uh, Dr. McDougal has a nice uh, video of this at his uh, YouTube channel. It's called uh, High Fat Meal Blood Sludge. And they were looking in the cheek pouches. Him and uh, Dr. Swank did that uh, project. And you could see... Um, after high fat meal, the red blood cells sludging together. And we'll talk about some research studies that show the same thing. Um, saturated fat also is typical meat fat, is saturated fat, meaning that there's no double bonds between the adjacent carbons. And those things can interdigitate very tightly. Saturated fat is solid at room temperature. So it makes red blood cell plasma membranes stiffer when a person eats a high percentage of saturated fat. Junk food tends to be associated with um, more trans fats, for example, which function similar to saturated fats in terms that they're very stiff and can interdigitate. Uh, the lack of fiber also is characteristic of uh, a lack of plants in the diet, a lot of meat and processed food. And a high meat diet tends to lead to increased estrogen, increased obesity, diabetes, and also increased TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, due to the difference in the gut bacteria associated with a high meat diet. Excess dietary fructose is also a problem because excess dietary fructose, um, especially if it's ingested in one of these energy drinks or sweetened drinks, the liver mostly just makes that into saturated fat, so it has a similar effect as meat. Plus, they, it, you get increased uric acid, 
And that also is a bridging molecule to stick red blood cells together, which then increases the risk of atherosclerosis. Diabetes, which is primarily caused by eating fat. There's a few other things that'll do it. High stress, high cortisol, high sodium, but primarily by high dietary fat, it leads to insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. The hyperglycemia leads to endothelial cell dysfunction. And we talked about this in my lectures on diabetes, but the bottom line is hyperglycemia and diabetes causes endothelial cell dysfunction, and that's going to lead to atherosclerosis. Anything that causes endothelial dysfunction or makes blood clot more or makes blood thicker, they all increase atherosclerosis. Um, you get glycation of the red blood cells, and that's measured with a clinical test called hemoglobin A1C, which is an indicator of how uh, a person's blood glucose has been over the course of the last three months. Um, what should be a person's goal? And here's a real important number. It's probably the most important lab test in all of medicine to remember is you want to keep your total cholesterol below 150. That's the parameter that people go by based on the Framingham study. That's the parameter that Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn went by with his patients, and he has the best results of any doctor in the entire world. That's Caldwell Esselstyn from the Cleveland Clinic. Um, sedentary, uh, predisposed to atherosclerosis because, you know, blood is not like water. If you have water in a cup, it's a Newtonian fluid, okay? It's the same at rest as it is moving, whereas uh, blood is what's called thixotropic, meaning that if you have it at rest, it'll clot. It doesn't stay the same. It's non-Newtonian fluid. And I think that's what it gets a person. When you first get out of a car after a long car ride, you feel all stiff and you got a little bit of pain. I think it's because your arteries all over your skeletal muscles are constricted, and maybe even a few of them are thrombosed. A lot of little ones, it's not an irreversible thrombus. It's uh, aggregation of RBCs. We'll come back, open up after, you know, 30 seconds or so. Okay, what is some of the proof of the benefits of plants with regard to prevention of atherosclerosis and treatment of atherosclerosis? Well, really, you know, if you can slow the progression of it, and there's even some evidence that it can be partially reversed. Walter Kempner, um, he's the, the famous doc who put a lot of patients on a rice diet in North Carolina in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And he had incredibly good results. Um, that was really what I would call a 95-5 diet, 90% carbohydrates, 5% protein, 5% fat. So we did a previous uh, Nutrition Hero lecture on him. Nathan Pritikin, he was an extraordinary individual. The guy's a genius. He had coronary artery disease himself. And in effort to learn how to save himself, he taught a lot of other people how to uh, prevent coronary artery atherosclerosis. So we'll be talking about him more later, but it's an extraordinary story. Dr. Dean Ornish did some wonderful studies of reducing atherosclerosis as published in 1998. So more and more evidence accumulated. By the way, Kempner had 19,000 patients. Okay, he had a lot of patients. Ornish did a nice, more formal study to show that it was possible to reverse atherosclerosis and certainly to halt its progression. Caldwell Esselstyn, um, his uh, especially famous paper, 2014, incredible results, 99.4% of patients with no recurrent cardiovascular events. Um, that has been compared to the Lyon study, which is a version of the Mediterranean-type diet, and they had a 25% patients ended up having vascular events. So those results are 30 times worse than uh, Dr. Esselstyn's results. That's good to know, because a lot of people think the Mediterranean diet is a, is a good idea. You know, what is the Mediterranean diet? You know, what country are you talking about? People are really obese in a lot of those countries. In Greece, are you talking about Greece? Are you talking about Spain? Are you talking about Italy, Crete? What are you talking about? So usually in my experience, people use Mediterranean diet as an excuse to eat a lot of olive oil and fish and wine and cheese, and I don't think those are healthy foods. Okay, next thing, epidemiology. It's pretty obvious when you look at epidemiology, the benefits of a highly plant-based diet. The, probably the best one, if you only want to look at one, <clears throat> take a look at the Tatahumata in northern Mexico and compare them with the Pima in Arizona. Originally, pretty similar together populations. They got separated after 1848 with the Tatahumata staying in northern Mexico. They don't have any cars. They just run everywhere. They're incredibly physically fit. They can run hundreds of miles in two days. They have a special holiday event once a year where they do that. All the guys in town, not just like the fast guy. Whereas the Pima have eaten out of the standard American diet, SAD diet, tons of obesity, diabetes, etc. And then these are other populations, Uganda, rural Kenya, when they were eating their traditional diets, Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Loma Linda, Seventh-day Adventist, and in comparison with the other California person, Nicoya, Costa Rica, some of these places, of course, are blue zones, famous 
um, from the studies of Dan Butner and National Geographic. But I'm going to tell you, it's always like this. All the traditional plant-based populations are pretty skinny and healthy with an absence of, this, absence of these modern westernized diseases. And then when they start getting industrialized and having fast food places and eating refined flour and meat and oil and all these modern processed foods, they get fat and sick and diabetic, hypertensive with a lot of coronary artery disease. Okay, next question. Is cholesterol really associated with atherosclerosis? And this is something that's happening a lot these days. There's really sort of this paleo craze, <clears throat> um, low carb diet thing. And I think what that's about is I'm not sure exactly what's behind it, but you know, I think big money is funding it all, maybe from big food or because there's actually billions of dollars at stake here in a sense that you know, big food, fast food, they want processed food. It's convenient for them with a lot of preservatives in it, artificial chemicals, because that can stay on a shelf for years and not spoil and have to be returned to the manufacturer. So that's probably how processed food is always going to be. So in order to keep people eating all that junk food and meat and oils, they have to convince people that it's, you know, there's something positive about it. I can tell you that there isn't. There's, there's no science behind, in my opinion, an average person eating a paleo diet or a low carb diet. I think those will lead to obesity in the long run and poor health. In the short run, they can tweak the studies and make it look good, but when you look at it long run, they're, they're not good for health. You know, for example, there's some proponents of a low carb diet for diabetic patients. In the short run, that might look pretty good, but in the long run, they've got high insulin resistance, they fail the oral glucose tolerance test, and they end up having health problems down the road. Okay, so. Uh, I just let you know about that. Okay, what is some other support for the cholesterol involvement in atherosclerosis? The Mr. Fit study, they had a huge sample set, 356,000 men. The higher the cholesterol, the more coronary events. So that's pretty convincing. Ansel Keys seven country study, we briefly mentioned that. <clears throat> Peter Kuo did a lot of research in the 1950s, early 1960s. And back then, a lot of the research papers were better. You know, they didn't have much equipment or anything fancy, but they really wanted to know the answer. Nowadays, you got to be real careful what you read from the scientific literature because so much of it is funded by corporations that are just trying to promote their product and the literature is totally biased. So anyways, in 1959, Peter Kuo showed that the more hyperlipidemia patients had, the more claudication. That means difficulty walking um, with the, that implying that it was because the high lipid was impairing blood flow. And also he noticed that patients' oxygen saturation uh, was dropping from 96% to 92.5%, which is a bigger drop than, than it seems. The PO2, the pressure of the oxygen, was also dropping quite a bit. At the top of the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, it's relatively flat. So a healthy person is not going to notice a drop from 96 to 92.5%. But somebody who has poor oxygenation, let's say they're a smoker with chronic emphysema, for them to drop you know, 3.5 percent points could be significant, lead to shortness of breath. Okay, and Peter Quo did another study in 1955 where he had a bunch of patients with chronic stable chest pain due to angina, cardiac angina, meaning that when their arteries narrow, they have, they have chest pain because they already have a baseline narrowing. So anything that superimposes more narrowing or decline in blood flow will bring about chest pain in them. And so this is back before the days of IRBs and you could do studies like this. He took a bunch of cardiac angina patients and he fed them high fat meals and then he checked their their lipids and their blood every 30 minutes. And what he found was peak lipemia was about five hours after high fat meal. So it's pretty high at four hours and it's peaks at five, pretty high at six, and then it gradually tapers off. And right when there was peak lipemia, that's when they had the most chest pain. So that's a good indicator that the chest pain was due to the hyperlipidemia, which makes sense because the hyperlipidemia is going to induce Rouleau formation, a sticking together, French word for stack of coins of all the red blood cells. So it's hard to push them through the capillary. You know, the red blood cells trying to get into that capillary, they're all stuck together. It's a big blob. Pressure has to go up and hypertension causes all kinds of problems with blood flow. Um, And, you know, some people say, well, why am I so interested in atherosclerosis? Because this is what determines if people live or die. And not only is it interesting, but it's once you get it, it's easy. It, it's easy to avoid this and it's easy to understand it. But there's a little effort in the beginning, but you get past that. This is great stuff to know. 
Okay, a cholesterol association with atherosclerosis continued. A couple papers, Friedman and Rosenman paper from 1964. And they took an 80 times microscope and put it right over a person's eye and they fed them a high fat meal. And they could see the Rouleau formation effects of arteries basically stenosing and occluding. They, and you know, they gave them, I think some salt was probably in this meal and it probably caused a little vasoconstriction too. But that's kind of my point. Sodium causes constriction of arteries. You know, instead of being wide open, they clamp down. And then the high fat makes the blood thick, like a milkshake instead of like water. So that's a bad combination. The arteries are narrowed, so pressure has to go up because of the narrowed arteries. And then the blood is thick, so pressure has to go up even more to pump them through. And as we spoke about in my atherosclerosis part one lecture, things that cause high blood pressure start distorting flow patterns. Instead of being laminar like a hand, a nice parabolic velocity profile of the red blood cells relative to the white blood cells and the plasma cells, one then sees distorted turbulent flow, which confuses the lining of the arteries endothelium and leads to clots, atherosclerosis, and even more worsening of oxygen delivery to the tissue. Okay, um, it's rather frightening. You know, here's a person's eye, you see all these big blood vessels on the pre, and then you see them losing blood vessels. Now, there's collateral flow to most of those segments and they come back. Otherwise, people will go blind pretty rapidly and they don't go blind that rapidly. But they do progressively, gradually lose their eyesight. And I can also tell you, anybody losing their eyesight should be worried about their brain because it's a, just like being impotent in a man is a strong indicator that he has significant coronary artery disease. Losing eyesight due to cataracts, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, aging-related macular degeneration are strong indicators that you're losing brain cells and you're headed towards cognitive decline, so you really want to get your health act together. Okay, next paper, Ferenc, LDL causes atherosclerosis. Okay, and then, then another thing comes up is, what about good fats? Good fats is a slogan in my opinion, just to brainwash people, make them think it's okay to eat a lot of fat. And I think this is kind of like the Mediterranean diet. It sounds good, you know, it's a simple-minded person. Yeah, I want good fats. But what does it lead to? It leads to people eating stuff that causes coronary artery atherosclerosis. There's been, you know, a couple of good studies. And for example, Blankenhorn study found it didn't matter what type of fat you fed the person. Saturated fat, a MUFA is monounsaturated fat, a PUFA is polyunsaturated fatty acid, they all had about the same amount of atherosclerotic plaque and worsened, okay? The thing that matters is getting the total fat down. We talked about Nathan Pritikin before, and the best thing I learned from Nathan Pritikin is he said, fat is bad. You want to minimize your amount of dietary fat. Um, here's a paper by Lindart. Um, olive oil, soybean oil, palm oil, they all had similar acute detrimental effects over the endothelial function, okay? Friedman and Rosenman, the guys who did that uh, 80 times microscope on the eye, they found that they would get Rouleau formation even if it was an unsaturated fat. And this is testing the effects of unsaturated fats on, on lipemia and the conjunctival circulation. So you're not going to win with fat. There's no way to win with fat. That's uh, my impression from studying it. Uh, the brachial artery reactivity test is a test where you put a tourniquet over the upper arm and then you uh, feed them different things. And you can see how well does the artery able to vasodilate upon release of the tourniquet. And the more fat they've eaten in general, the worse will be their ability to vasodilate that brachial artery once the tourniquet is removed, indicating poor function of the lining cells of that artery. Um, next study, Franz, uh, he found that when they decrease blood cholesterol by replacing saturated fat with vegetable oils, they could lower cholesterol a little bit, but there was no significant change in cardiovascular events or mortality. And so again, this goes back to, you're not gonna win with fat. In terms of all fats end up impairing blood flow. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn pointed out that there's no studies, because Caldwell Esselstyn, you know, as we spoke about before, he's a doctor with, who wrote the book, Preventing Reverse Heart Disease. And uh, I think I got a copy of it right here. Here it is, this is a great book. Anybody worried about coronary heart disease? Probably the best book on the subject. Um, about preventing coronary artery disease specifically. I went and trained with the guys for real. Um, and what did he say? Because he tells his patients, no nuts. And some people don't like that. They go, well, nuts are a plant food. Why can't I eat them? He said, because they're high in fat and they got a lot of saturated fat. And saturated fat, fat in general, impairs blood flow. And so people should not eat them. I mean, this is serious stuff. Malcarn infarction a lot of times presents a sudden death. Okay. I knew this really rich guy. He owned a bank. I almost married his daughter, okay? 
and uh, he you know went off and was eating a lot of high fat food thought he was doing all right and he had a mild cardiac infarction and so you know all his money couldn't save him you gotta your health depends on what you eat that's the main thing it comes down to so Esselstyn does not allow his patients to eat nuts because they got a lot of fat including saturated fat and you know remember those are sick people those are not you know young healthy walker talkers they're, they're people that are worried about coronary artery disease. Some of them had previous coronary problems. So you have to be extra careful when you have known coronary artery disease or you're high risk for it. Okay, and then another thing that comes up is what about some of these people who are old and they've got um, coronary artery events or cerebrovascular events despite having a relatively low total cholesterol? That is true. I've seen some of these patients. A lot of them are already being treated. So they've already got through medications, got their cholesterol level lowered. Uh, one thing I like, I like this painting. It's called The Voyage of Life by Thomas Cole. He was primarily a landscape artist from the mid-1800s, but this is one of the greatest paintings of all time. And there's the baby being born. Then there's youth is like a, like a 20-something guy going off to his dream in the sky. If you look at these paintings, they're worth looking up. Thomas Cole, Voyage of Life. But the best one is the middle-aged guy. So the middle-aged guy is like, no longer is this a youthful dream, high testosterone 20-year-old guy. This is like reality and a guy in his let's say in his 40s, and he's, he's in a boat going over the rapids, his oars have fallen on, he's hoping things will turn out okay. And the reason I tell you that is this is the age where you got the best chance to save somebody. If a man or a woman gets her act together in middle age, the earlier the better, they can go on to live a nice, long, healthy life and to 90 years of age and see their great-grandchildren, okay? But if they don't get their act together, they usually just go downhill and they're suffering by their 50s and miserable quite often in their 60s um, and so what I'm trying to say is that total cholesterol level is very important in middle age and the sooner they turn around the better I see tons of CT scans of patients I look at their spine I look at their hearts their aortas their carotids and in third in, in the 30s and early 40s there's usually almost no overt signs of major disease but by typically late 40s and 50s, I keep seeing more progressive irreversible disease. You know, spinal disc degeneration, calcification of the coronaries, calcification of the ascending aorta, and more and more arterial stenosis and whatnot. And what I'm trying to say is the more time goes by that a person's living unhealthy, they're not exercising, they're stressed out, drinking too much caffeine, high fat diet, the more likely it's becoming irreversible. So that's why you want to turn these things around as fast as you can. Okay, old people are fragile. Um, they're often fixed in their diet and lifestyle and they don't want to change. I, I talk to tons of old people that are real sick and they often say, what are you going to do at my age? Well, that's a poor attitude. If you want to be healthy, you should say, how can I be as physically fit, as thin as I should be, as mentally sharp, as physically strong as I can be? Why not be the best you can be? Okay, so loss of the Windcastle effect, we talked about that, losing the elastic fibers in the ascending thoracic aorta, which is the second heart, because that elastic recoil during cardiac relaxation maintains diastolic flow. So that's one of the first things that's lost. And then atherosclerosis starts coming after that. We talked about a diet high in sodium, then low in magnesium, and uh, potassium predisposing to hypertension. With increased aging, there's a markedly decreased production of nitric oxide in the endothelial cells. That especially applies. Whenever you hear a trend, ask yourself, what population is it in? You know, the persons in these healthy plant communities, Tadahumara, rural canyons, Yanomamos in South America, they've got normal blood pressure in their 70s, okay? So these things probably don't apply to them as much as to somebody who's lived an unhealthy lifestyle, if you will. But in general, the trend is nitric oxide goes down significantly a lot as a person gets older. So it's going to be harder for that endothelium to compensate for poor health habits and dietary habits. The platelets in the blood are slightly more activated, more prone to thrombose. There's elevated blood levels of von Willenbrand's factor. There's decreased endothelial precursor cells, abbreviated EPC. They often call them endothelial progenitor cells. Same thing. There's stem cells to replace endothelial cells, arterial lining cells when there's an arterial injury or a blood clot. Um, decreased immune function. I look at CTs and MRIs of the neck all the time, and I can tell you the older a person gets, the less lymph nodes they have in their neck as an indicator that they have less immune system function. You know, the thymus atrophies in early adulthood, and that's what makes the T cells the T lymphocytes. And so good health habits help to preserve that immune system function. 
a uh, person needs to exercise. When a person's exercising, they're going to increase their lymphatic flow 10 to 30 fold. And that sucks all the debris, the garbage out of the extracellular matrix. So things leak out of blood vessels that can't get back into the blood vessel. Cells, you know, outside the main highway streets, if you will, of blood vessel delivery of oxygen and nutrients, they release products into their extracellular matrix. And events happen in the extracellular matrix where debris accumulates and it's cleaned out by lymphatics. Normally, we're designed to walk all day looking for food, and that keeps the lymphatic flow good, and it's like a vacuum. It sucks out all the garbage from the extracellular matrix. So if you don't have good lymphatic flow, you're accumulating debris like garbage in the streets when the, when the garbage man's on strike, if you will. And that's going to secondarily start to impair blood flow in those areas, and it can lead to th thrombosis, clot formation in those areas. So it's a really good idea to make sure you're getting some walk-in every day and just to keep moving in whatever environment you're in. You look at all these blue zone healthy people, you know, they're always, you know, doing something to keep busy and move. They're not, they're not in a health club or anything, but you can do tons of little things to keep yourself moving. Get a standing desk, you know, walk to the farther bathroom, walk stairs when you get a chance. All kinds of little things will keep you more fit. Um, and that's just that attitude. I'm going to be the best I can be. Just having that attitude you end up a lot healthier rather than, well, I'm doing okay. The typical sort of ignorant person says, I'm doing okay. Fine, if you like being mediocre, but if you want to be the best you can be, you should constantly be alert to how can I get the most out of this day for physical fitness, for learning, you know, for whatever else you're interested in. Okay, um, a lot of these old people are poor, living off Social Security, and they don't eat much food, but they still eat a lot of junk food. Um, and again, even if their cholesterol is normal, they've got a lot of insulin resistance. A lot of times their arteries are all calcified. I see their, I see their cascans. I see sometimes, you know, carotid bifurcation calcifications, of course, but aortic arch calcifications, coronary calcifications, aortic valve calcifications, mitral valve calcifications. They're calcified all over the place, okay? So that's a very poor function of their cardiac valves and of their blood vessels when everything's all calcified. Um, they also become progressively iron overloaded, many of them, you know, because meat's difficult. Iron is difficult to excrete from the body. Women excrete it in menstruation, but men don't. So men tend to become iron overloaded at a younger age. And that's another problem with eating high meat because there's a lot of iron in the heme and it's rapidly absorbed in comparison with plant iron. Okay, a couple other thoughts now. Hypertension causes endothelial injury. There's a nice picture of this in the atherosclerosis part one lecture. It disrupts laminar flow at bifurcations, like the left main coronary artery, the widow maker, so to speak, of the, of the coronaries. Um, you know, almost always see calcifications there in patients, you know, over 55 years of age. Um, there's causes excess turbulent flow, which activates some of the platelets. And a key point is you don't see atherosclerosis in low pressure vessels. You don't see atherosclerosis in the veins. You don't see atherosclerosis in the pulmonary arteries because the pressure is low there. So the reason I'm mentioning that is ath hypertension and high cholesterol are the two main risk factors for atherosclerosis. Hypertension because it causes vascular injury and it disrupts normal patterns of blood flow. And then hyperlipidemia because the LDL cholesterol sticks the red blood cells together into Rouleau formation. Those are the two most common and two most important risk factors for atherosclerosis. The veins can get atherosclerosis when you take a vein from the leg and you put it onto the heart with a coronary artery bypass graft, CABG, okay? Also in the arm, you can put in a dialysis graft and it can be prosthetic material. Atherosclerotic plaques will form in there. And that's a big statement because you can't explain that with lipid theory alone. And you can't explain that with conventional thinking on atherosclerosis because the prosthetic graft in the arm, it, uh, has no intima, it has no tunica, you know, middle layer, all right? So the point is those covering cells that cover up the plaque to make it subintimal in the subendothelial space, those come from the blood. They are endothelial precursor cells. There are circulating endothelial precursor cells. There's also local endothelial cells that have some stem cell function, um, but that's a key point, that they're circulating endothelial precursor cells, and those decrease with aging, and also risk factors for atherosclerosis often indirectly will lead to a decreased activity or production of endothelial precursor stem cells. Okay, what else? Pulmonary arteries. If you look at the pulmonary arteries of the chest, pulmonary artery pressure is low, so they don't get atherosclerosis there, but when a person has chronic disease of the pulmonary arteries, like let's say chronic pulmonary emboli that have caused a lot of scarring in the pulmonary arteries, and they end up with uh, high pulmonary pressures, those patients will get coronary artery atherosclerosis. I've seen that plenty of times. 
pulmonary hypertension, and they start to get calcifications and atherosclerotic plaques um, in their pulmonary arteries. But normally that doesn't happen. So the point of all this was how important blood pressure is. Okay, and then a little bit more information on stem cells. There's been transplant experiments which will show that with the heart transplanted from another so source, they'll still have, when an atherosclerotic plaque forms, their own endothelial cells forming the lining of it because they come from the stem cells from the bone marrow. Okay, why is hypertension such a big deal? Because the hypertension, you really want to do everything you can to minimize it. Get your sodium under control, get your diet under control, your exercise, your sleep, quit your caffeine. Because if your pressure is really high, there's a risk of bleeding into your brain. That's rare though. I hardly ever see those. I'm a neuroradiologist. I look at brains all day. And I don't very often see a large intracranial bleed. They call them an IPH, interparenchymal hemorrhage. But what I do see quite a bit is cerebral microbleeds from hypertension. So you're still pretty high risk for cerebral microbleeds if you have very uh, high, high blood pressure. Okay. Um, if you overtreat hypertension, though, it's dangerous because if you're chronically overtreating it, then you don't have enough blood supply to the brain. Chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, and that's a major cause of cognitive decline. The main thing I see when I look at brains, I don't see that stuff you read about in a magazine about temporal lobe atrophy, after uh, Alzheimer's pattern. I almost never see that. What I see all the time, every day, all day long, with cognitive decline, memory loss, possible Alzheimer's, I just see diffuse cerebral atrophy. The whole brain is shrunken, and it's atrophic. And the only thing that makes sense for that is apoptosis, meaning that program cell death due to lack of blood supply. Um, I talked about this a lot in my lecture on how to prevent uh, dementia, but just be aware of that. So hi hypertension is a pretty big deal because you got to walk through that narrow therapeutic window of not being too high or too low. Okay, why should hypertension be treated as soon as possible? In addition, the higher the pressure is for the more years it goes on, the more the arteries compensate for the high pressure by having a thicker wall, and that'll become scarred in and chronic. So they're losing their ability, and that'll narrow the lumen too. So they're losing their ability to stay open, and you're ending up with a bunch of like fixed diameter pipes instead of a dynamic system is what you're supposed to have. And so that leads to chronic hypertension as well. So hypertension progressively, the more decades it continues, the more ir irreversible it tends to become. Um, and then also the arteries become calcified. Um, tends to be worse in the lower extremities because pressure is higher. You know, you're standing up, your pressure is going to be higher in your legs. Um, and they call this thickening of the small arteries, like the arterioles, those are very small arteries, hyaline protein thickening, um, and, the, and then lumen narrows. So that's pretty bad. A lot of tiny little strokes in the brain are related to hypertension. Every day I see like hundreds of little strokes, old strokes. Okay. Um, Diabetes-related hyperglycemia also causes this so-called microangiopathy, damage to the arterial small cells, excuse me, and that leads to hyaline sclerosis of them. That means thickening of the wall, narrowing of the lumen, decreased blood supply of the tissues. These are all things you don't want. Okay, we'll briefly talk about the vasovessorum theory of Haverich. I mentioned him before. He's the guy who wrote this book on atherosclerosis, cardiac surgeon. And so he claims that the outer, so you got three layers on a wall. So let's say you got, uh, let me get a couple of markers here. So let's say these are three layers of an arterial wall. All right, there's the tunica intima, then there's the middle layer, then there's the outer layer, also called the vasovessorum or tunica adventitia. And that tunica adventitia, in a big artery supplies blood flow to the outer half of the arterial wall. And the point is, if that gets occluded, that can lead to ischemia, lack of blood supply to this middle layer, and it can become weakened. Um, new blood vessels will try to grow in there. That's called uh, angiogenesis. And those new blood vessels are kind of leaky. Sometimes they'll bleed, and that can lead to rapid expansion of the atherosclerotic plaque. That can even lead to plaque rupture, and that can cause uh, thrombosis of the main artery. Um, you can get total lack of blood supply to a part of the middle layer and it can infarct, meaning it can die, and then it becomes weak and the artery can balloon outward. That's an aneurysm. And so this idea of same causation for aneurysm and atherosclerosis is important because they typically have the same risk factors. They even call them atherosclerotic uh, aneurysms. Okay, And this whole process of making tissue ischemia within an artery, that increases the risk of atherosclerotic plaque and aneurysms. But 
the same process of ischemia in a standard solid organ, like let's say the liver, the pancreas, you know, that increases the risk of cancer. Okay, we've talked about that before too, the metabolic component of cancer, Varberg's research and whatnot, hypoxia causing dysfunction of the mitochondria, leading to reliance only on anaerobic glycolysis. So it's not good. Okay, a couple words here from William C. Roberts, MD. He's a famous pathologist, best cardiac pathologist in the world. And he did a great paper. I think I got it listed in here, yeah. Uh, Roberts, 2018, quantitative assessment extent of atherosclerosis in the major epicardial coronary arteries at necroscopy, at autopsy. of a bunch of patients that died from myocardial infarction, sudden death. And he summarized about 2,000 autopsies of the coronary arteries with incredible illustrations. If you really want to get a sense of what happens in the coronary arteries, like you're trying to decide if it's a big deal or not or what you need to do, take a look at that paper. And actually, I recommend you go to his YouTube channel. William C. Roberts has a YouTube channel where he's got lectures about this exact paper. And he shows the illustrations from the paper. He shows them in his YouTube lecture. And when you see them, I think it'll help you to get it. Because in my experience, a typical person says, well, I got one blockage in you know my left coronary artery and I got it stented and then they think they're better. No, that's not going to change your all-cause mortality probably at all unless it happened during treatment of an acute myocardial infarction. So, so here's a quote from William uh, C. Roberts from his paper that we just uh, mentioned here. Single vessel disease is a myth. There's always a diffuse pattern of atherosclerosis of similar severity diffusely. It's a diffuse disease. And so what that means is you're not going to win the game of coronary artery patency with just an angioplasty stent or a bypass. That can help, but it's a diffuse process. The only way, the best odds come from a strict 100% plant-based vegan diet, low sodium, like Esselstyn's approach. I agree with Esselstyn's approach. I can't see a problem with it. Um, and like I said, stenting can save your life in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction or unstable angina. But most people just have chronic chest pain due to chronic narrowing. Um, and then when you look at a coronary artery atherosclerotic plaque under a microscope, and he shows pictures of it, it's mostly fibrotic scar tissue. A little bit of fat, a little bit of cholesterol, and it varies on depending on how old the plaque is. And then it'll progressively over time have a tendency to calcify. Um, so to some extent, that more calcification implies an older plaque, but it doesn't always follow a clear time course. What he noticed was cardiac cath would tend to underestimate the amount of stenosis because when you look at a vessel in a lumen, you'll have stenosis in one spot, and then the way you judge stenosis at the adjacent spot is by comparing it to the so-called adjacent normal lumen. But the adjacent lumen is usually not normal, so um, it'll be narrowed itself, so that it ends up being worse than it looks on a cardiac cath. Um, uh, Dr. Roberts had some interesting comments, too. He noticed that it's easy to induce atherosclerosis in a herbivore. Just feed it a high-fat diet, okay? Um, but you can't do it in a carnivore, okay? They're designed to eat a high-fat diet. Humans, our physiology, our metabolism, our intestinal tract, all our features, they match herbivores. That's an important point to realize. And you can think about it, too. If you're walking down a path in the forest, there's a dead deer on the ground, a carcass. You want to get down on your knees and take a bite out of it, you know, drink its blood, chew its brains. No, it's disgusting, okay? If you put a bowl of fruit on a table, you salivate. You're made for that. Uh, our jaw goes side to side. Our teeth are flat like a horse and other herbivores. Okay. Okay, and some other thoughts. Well, is atherosclerosis really a, a clot, a blood clot, a thrombus? And like I said, all the pathologists agree that it is. When I look at it on CT angiography, it's the same density as a blood clot. And, oh, William Craig Roberts in his paper, he showed nice atherosclerotic plaques and how they have a laminated um, surface quite often. And the point of that is, they're like the rings of a tree, and that's an indicator of ongoing thrombus and repair, thrombus and repair, thrombus and repair, characteristic of something formed by a blood clot. Also down here, ASP stands for atherosclerotic plaque, recanalization. And in patients with chronic pulmonary embolism, you'll see that the artery was initially occluded, and then it starts to open up again in little parts, with little holes in it like Swiss cheese. And the point is, you'll see that in atherosclerotic plaques as well sometimes, and those are all indicators of a thrombus, just like a pulmonary embolism is a clot from the leg, a deep vein thrombosis that moved up to the chest, um, atherosclerotic plaque can do the same thing.
Okay, so where and why do clots form? They typically happen initially at bifurcation. So right where the common carotid artery bifurcates into the internal and external carotid artery and at the bifurcations in the coronary arteries. Okay, that's where it initially starts. And then those uh, accumulations of atherosclerotic plaque cause narrowing and that'll lead to disruptive flow and you'll get atherosclerosis right distal to that and the process progressively marches all the way up and down the coronaries. That's why I think it's good to see uh, William Craig Roberts' papers and the images from it because you'll see that this is not one fixed blockage. You've got typical coronary artery patient has severe atherosclerosis all over the place. It's, it's almost shocking how extensive it is. And the only way to minimize that everywhere is by fixing something in the diet. And also you can take medications to lower it. And medications can help. But in general, the diet tends to be a good way to go, less likely to have side effects, uh, just to get a sense of total cholesterol. I'm 100% plant-based, low-fat vegan. My total cholesterol is 93. The average American has a total cholesterol of 227, okay? If you're eating meat and oils and processed food, it's going to be hard, uh, very difficult to get your total cholesterol below 150, and you're satisfying your hunger. You know, versus on a plant diet, it's easy to do. Uh, most plant populations will have total cholesterol. It's in the ballpark of 110 to 140. Okay, so where does it occur? We talked about bifurcations. Also, areas of marked tortuosity like splenic artery, distal to stenosis, we talked about that. Why does it happen? Because the high blood pressure injures, injures the arteries at that site and it disrupts the flow patterns. It leads to these retrograde currents called eddy currents that are slow and they're prone to thrombosing on that site. When the artery senses, and we talked about this more in the last lecture, but when the artery senses abnormal flow, rather than straight laminar flow, this chaotic flow and flow retrograde flow, it senses that as an injury, and it'll start to withdraw its antithrombotic uh, covering, its antithrombotic glycocalyx, and it'll then express prothrombotic chemicals on its cell surface prone to clotting. Because you've lost the Windkessel effect, there's less diastolic flow, and that means there's more of a prolonged interval between systolic uh, contractions and pulsations of blood that interval that's prolonged allows more time for clotting. Old people being a little prone to having more platelet activation, more tendency for platelets to clot, another risk factor. Um, the turbulent flow itself increases platelet aggregation tendency. Um, if there's vasoconstricting things on board like sodium, a lot of sodium, that'll also increase the risk of it clotting. People make less nitric oxide vasodilator as they get older. So there's all these things gradually working towards increasing the risk of atherosclerosis as one gets older, especially if one has bad habits. I mean, the bottom line is as you get older, you get more fragile. So the smart thing to do is just be more careful about minimizing your risk factors. And it's all very doable. Okay, now atherosclerotic plaque and dialysis graphs. I think we briefly talked about that. The point being is you can form atherosclerotic plaques in a graph. You don't need the intima, the host intima, the grow rate over there from the adjacent endothelial cells. You can get it from the circulating uh, endothelial precursor cells. Okay, next, uh, atherothrombosis theory. You know, we talked about that's a magnificent paper, and again, it's worth seeing the lectures at his YouTube site. The next guy I want to tell you about is Gregory Sloop. I think he's the best atherosclerosis researcher in the world today. His book is called Blood Viscosity. I think I got a copy of it right here. Blood Viscosity, its role in cardiovascular pathophysiology. If you're interested in atherosclerosis, I think this is the best book on understanding atherosclerosis. I've read tons of stuff on atherosclerosis. Um, and he was a big um, researcher involved in figuring out how LDL cholesterol causes Rouleau formation, which is a, a real key thing. Um, so there's a, some paper citations by him. Um, also, LDL increases the risk of a clot in the legs. Deep vein thrombosis is another indicator that LDL, when it's present in high amounts, it becomes prothrombotic. It increases the tendency to clot. Okay, unifying theory of atherosclerosis was proposed by Gregory Sloop, MD. Basically, he noticed that anything that injures the endothelium, the lining cells of the artery, or that makes the blood thicker, makes it hypercoagulable, they cause atherosclerosis. So the way you can explain all these atherosclerosis events is just say, a clot forms in the artery and blocks it up, okay? And that makes sense, that matches the microscopic appearance of it called the histology of it or histopathology of it. Um, and all these other theories, they're subsets of, of, of types and occurrences of atherosclerosis.
Okay, some other things. Hemoglobin SS, that's sickle cell anemia. And the point is that a kid with sickle cell anemia can thrombose the coronary artery, have a myocardial infarction, have a stroke with no other risk factors. Okay, so it doesn't require high cholesterol. doesn't even require high blood pressure in this setting when they're markedly hypercoagulable because their cells, instead of being round, they're shaped like a sickle. And the reason why sickle cell anemia is present in significant amounts is because the intermediate version of it, sickle cell trait, when there's only one of the genes for it instead of both of them, you know, has a protective effect against malaria. Okay, next thing, diabetes. We talked about the diabetic hyperglycemia injuring the endothelium. Um, endothelial cells can't turn themselves off. They can't keep the glucose out. And that, that, that gets back to the diabetes lectures, the Brownlee paper and everything. So diabetes is a major cause of vascular disease, and it plugs up the arteries in the eyes. They go blind. It plugs up the arteries in the feet. They get their feet amputated. Any hospital in this country does a couple of foot amputations every day for diabetes. It's super common. Um, let's see. Obesity tends to go hand in hand with diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, elevated homocysteine from increased methionine. Again, that's much more common in meat than in plant foods. Also, a lack of folate. Folate means folate, so a lack of plant foods simultaneously. So not only when you change from eating a lot of meat in your diet, eating a lot of plants, you not only avoid the problems associated with the meat, you also get the benefits associated with the plant. So it's a double benefit. All oils are bad. I don't recommend you avoid every single one of them. Caldwell Esteson says no oils, not one drop. Okay, additional causes of atherosclerosis, um, air pollution, diesel exhaust. You know, it's good to be like a dog in a sense. Anything a dog doesn't like, it just moves away. When it smells something it doesn't like, it's, your nose is, is made to help you live and survive and be healthy. So if something smells bad, avoid it. If a bus drives by you, cover your nose, turn your head, take a deep breath when it's coming and get past it. Don't inhale that stuff. That particulate material is damaging to your arteries, damaging to your lungs, okay, damaging to your brain. Noise pollution, you know, try to avoid excessive noise. And, you know, the other thing, too, a lot of people listen to, like, really loud beat music. I can't think with that, you know, like my kid does that. And it's like, I want to hear a melody. And I want, if a music is too loud with a beat, it's almost like whatever thought in my brain, it's pushed out. So it's hard to think. And I spend a lot of time thinking about things. You know, some complex thing. I'm always trying to understand something. And so... Anyways, and then also loud noise, for whatever the reason, it's hard to think when there's loud noise. So do what you can to, you know, have avoid noise pollution, if you will, vision pollution. All these strobe lights everywhere are real pain. They're sort of obnoxious. It's like every truck around town thinks it has to have a strobe light on it right now. Great. Um, it's sort of, you know, visually disconcerting. It's like, what's the point of that? You know, real good for the kids to, you know, have that on a bus. Okay, stress. Anything that causes excessive stress is bad for your arterial blood flow because of cortisol. Stress hormones are cortisol and catecholamines, like adrenaline, noradrenaline, plus the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So stress is to get you to survive the next 5, 10 minutes being chased by a tiger in the dark. But it causes high blood pressure. It makes your blood prothrombotic. There are stress equivalents like drinking caffeine, being sleep deprived. So avoid those things as best you can. It increases, stress increases fibrinogen, the clotting protein in the blood, as well as factor eight antihemophilic factor. It increases von Willenbrown's factor in the blood. It increases platelet activation. All of these things increase your risk of blood clotting. So stress is bad. You know, when your old man, you know, has had a hard day, don't stress him out. It will increase his risk of a coronary event. Okay, next thing, broken heart syndrome, takotsubo. Now, takotsubo is really rare. Um, I believe that's a Japanese word where it's first described, but a very stressful emotional event. Like let's say a man and a woman were married for many years and the husband dies. Sometimes a woman's so emotionally stressed out that she dies too all of a sudden. And that can be from severe emotional stress. And I think, you know, maybe it's coronary artery vasospasm. It can even cause cardiac rupture of a real broken heart. So that's broken heart syndrome. Okay, next thing, additional causes of atherosclerosis. SLE is systemic lupus erythematous. Um, it can be associated with APS, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, making it even more thrombotic, sometimes called U syndrome. Um, and then rheumatoid arthritis. All these diseases associate increased inflammation, have increased fibrinogen. Um, and they cause a hypercoagulable phase. So again, a person can have a myocardial infarction or a stroke. Um, tobacco. It's a vasoconstrictor from the nicotine, but it also 
leads to hypoxia, lack of oxygen delivery to tissues, and then the hematocrit is increased, and so you get thick blood, predisposing to hypertension, atherosclerosis, etc. Alcohol, you know, a lot of it gets converted into fat in the liver, can cause fatty liver, increased blood lipid, saturated fat. I, I'm not, a, I don't believe in this drinking alcohol stuff. Um, I know people say maybe one or two drinks are cardioprotective, and then three or more are no longer cardioprotective. Fine, but you know, I would. What I would personally do is just avoid it. Um, whenever there's really big money behind a product, I mean, tons of people drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, and all that. There's often a lot of corporate research saying something is good when it's not. Uh, my advice: I don't, I'm not aware of anything good about alcohol. It's toxic. You know, it causes damage to tissues. You know, like people say, "Oh, I want to get drunk." Right? You want to, you know, poison your brain? I mean, I, I, in my opinion, I think that's ignorant. Okay, estrogenics. Um, they all promote obesity and can lead to hypertension and diabetes. So you want to avoid them. We got separate lectures on estrogen stuff, but that's a big topic, and very few people know about it. Um, again, you know, go with the flow. When in Rome, do as the Romans do for social skills. But if you want to be healthy, don't imitate the average person. The average person is not healthy. The average person is fat and sick, and many of them are cognitively impaired. You want to, one of the reasons why you'll notice doctors often talk kind of slow, kind of polite, real thoughtful, is because they don't know yet if the person they're talking to them is cognitively impaired. Because, you know, the people who are cognitively impaired, they go to hospitals a lot more. So doctors are very used to talking to a lot of people who are cognitively impaired. All these diabetics, post-stroke patients, meta other patients with these metabolic disorders. And so what I'm saying is you don't want to end up like that. So you want to optimize everything, not just get by, not just be less fat than your cousin. Okay, um, severe infections, the IgM antibodies will overcome the zeta potential. We talked about in the last lecture, cause the red blood cells stick together, low formation, etc. cetera. Polyvaria just means high hematocrit, okay? So what I'm doing here is just going through additional causes of atherosclerosis, and I'm kind of indirectly indicating how atherothrombosis theory explains all this stuff. Excess ferritin, now this is thought to potentially be a mechanism for excessive oxidative stress. That's, that's, iron's a big topic. It's not that common. That's the main problem. It's a contributing problem. Where does it come from? Mostly from eating meat or taking iron supplements. It's very unlikely that you need to take an iron supplement. Unless your doctor tells you you're anemia or some special thing, fine, but be careful with that. Okay, um, so we'll talk about that some other day. Next thing, chronic kidney disease. Lots of people are in mild uh, kidney failure. See that all the time, elevated. Uh, creatinine in the blood or um, impaired glomerular filtration rates, GFRs. Um, and it's mostly due to atherosclerosis type risk factors. Um, lack of vitamin C from not eating plants, lack of vitamin D. Go outside. It's much better to go outside and get your sunshine than it is to be taking vitamin D pills. Uh, I just go out in the sun, sit there a half hour, read a book, get plenty of sun. And because you want to have activated vitamin D, it's really the activated vitamin D that matters, you know, the 125 hydroxy vitamin D that matters rather than the one that's measured in the blood, the 25 hydroxy. That's not that important. It's the activated one that matters. Okay. So get your sunshine and be careful about doing things that can lower your activated vitamin D. All right. Okay. Like I recommend you avoid dairy. You don't want all that excess calcium. All right. Next thing, aging, like we talked about aging, makes you a little more fragile. LPA, um, LPA is interesting. It's sort of a genetically fixed thing, so we're not going to talk about that right now, but there's information on the slide if you're curious about LPA. Okay, here is a picture, and this is supposed to be Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn with his son, uh, Rip, and, you know, talk about great role models for the vegan diet. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, he's 88 years old. He's still physically fit, mentally sharp. His son, Rip, is a superstar athlete. So, and you're going to see that as a pattern. These vegans, they're skinny and they're healthy and they're sharp. They're with it. Um, you know, look at some of the famous vegans, you know, Dr. McDougall, Neil Bernard, um, T. Cole and Campbell. I mean, there's lots of other ones too. They're skinny and they're fit. You know, anybody can look good on a paleo up to about 40 if they're lifting weights a lot, exercising a lot. They can compensate for the bad diet. But it's hard to look good after 50 if you're eating a high-fat diet. And Esselstyn, I kind of joke, he's kind of like an Old Testament God, do it this way. And, you know, he's pretty strict about what he recommends, but the guy has the best results in the world from preventing coronary artery disease. You know, he gets the results. So 
You know, when you somebody's got coronary artery disease, they're scared. They're becoming impotent. They're scared. They want to know what works. And so a um, motivated person, they're going to follow it. He has good compliance with his patients. They also seek him out. So if you just talk to a random, you know, fat diabetic person, they're probably not too motivated. That's why they're overweight and diabetic. But somebody who's motivated enough to seek him out, then that's a motivated person. So they're more likely to comply with the diet. Okay, uh, what's the best diet to prevent atherosclerosis? Uh, Low-fat diet, as we spoke about. Fat is bad for blood flow. Low sodium. Sodium is a major vasoconstrictor, predisposing to hypertension, which predisposes to atherosclerosis. You want to minimize that. Tadahumata, eat low salt. The Yanomamo in South America, they eat probably about 200 milligrams a day. Even the so-called low-salt diet in the United States, a lot of times are recommending 2,000 milligrams a day, which is 10 times what the Yanomamo eat. A lot of people are eating way up over 7,000 and more. Uh, it's a lot of sodium, so it's not a surprise, a lot of hypertension. Uh, plant foods, no meat, not one bite. It's just like an alcoholic. You tell them you don't drink alcohol anymore if you want to solve this problem for yourself. So same thing for you, somebody who's trying to prevent coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis. No more meat. You don't take another bite the rest of your life. And it's easier to do that than to just have it once in a while, you know? You know, and you get married, you don't get to see your old girlfriend once in a while. No, you don't do that anymore. So... 100% um, whole foods, best to eat things that are a single ingredient. There's no label on beans, there's no label on rice, or on, you know, there's no added ingredients to a potato, to a sweet potato, that's the kind of stuff you want to eat. The exception of stuff I'd eat in a box is oatmeal and quinoa, so those are some of the rare exceptions. But in general, anything with multiple ingredients, I would stay away from it. I don't eat anything out of the can because there's aluminum lining, a BPA lining quite often inside of that, plus they often put lots of salt like a preservative and a flavorant in canned foods. No oil, not one drop. Uh, I don't care if it's olive oil. I don't. I personally think I would avoid omega-3s. I know some people like those. I, I actually don't think, I think they're poor for blood flow, they increase the risk of prostate cancer. No nuts, as we went through it with Esselstyn's recommendation, they're high in fat and saturated fat. No sweets. Sweets often got a lot of high fructose corn syrup in them which predisposes to hyperlipidemia. Uh, they can increase triglycerides in the blood as well, which are also atherogenic. Um, no sweetened drinks. Those are the worst. You know, you drink one of these sweetened drinks and you get this rapid bolus of uh, fructose. It all goes to the liver and a lot of it is made into fat and that predisposes to fatty liver. I recommend no caffeine. It's a stress equivalent. No alcohol, as we spoke about. Uh, I even recommend avoiding calcium supplements for most people. There's some special exceptions to that, but in general, they're overrated. We can talk about that some other time. Best thing to drink is just water. Okay, and then another question comes up is why do patients improve so fast? You're going to hear a lot of stories about people with um, atherosclerosis, cardiac angina that improve relatively quickly. Dr. Esselstyn talks about this as well as other uh, persons who take care of these patients and have seen it. Number one, you can reabsorb some of the lipid. Okay, that takes time, but it can happen. The necrotic core within an atherosclerotic plaque, that can also improve. Number three, uh, once the endothelium is no longer inhibited, let's say, by high sodium and other things toxic to it, smoking cigarettes, et cetera, it'll start to produce more nitric oxide again. So you get a vasodilator effect from that. Um, when you're not order, eating the dietary fat, you no longer have the Rouleau formation. The red blood cell plasma membranes no longer have so much excess of saturated fat, so they become more deformable. Pressure starts to improve. Um, the person's body weight starts to improve. That also helps prevent hypertension and diabetes. So there's multiple reasons why multiple good things are happening simultaneously to lead to better blood flow. So people often do have really pretty significant improvements in three weeks or sooner than that. Okay, so this is just kind of a little joke, another illustration. This is from a book I wrote a long time ago, kind of a vegan reformation about health. And it's just kind of a fun introductory book. I, I wrote that like four years ago, and I've learned a lot since then. I, there's things that I do a little different now than I did at that time. Okay, choose foods from the so-called tree of life. Avoid the foods from the tree of death. You know, just visual jokes. People like pictures better than drawing, but it's hard to get a picture. Okay, um... So a couple remaining points about uh, optimizing health. We're just about done here. Lifestyle to prevent atherosclerosis. You want to exercise, like we said. It clears out the, 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 the extracellular matrix, gets the lymph flowing, 
That's a real characteristic thing of healthy people. They exercise. Um, teeth, keep them clean because if when you start getting uh, dental problems, it goes with having a lot of atherosclerosis. It's a sign of poor health care. I can tell you, whenever I look at these cognitively impaired people, these brains, you know, for memory loss, rule out dementia, rule out Alzheimer's, all this stuff, they almost always have a cataract in the eye, a history of some other eye disease, and they have a bunch of missing teeth, all right? Those all go together with the person who is aging poorly. So take good care of your teeth. And what does that mean to me? Avoiding sweets, avoiding acidic things like soda pop. Get those little dental brushes, clean your teeth out after you eat. You can do that anytime, pretty easy. At night, I recommend you floss because your saliva production drops at night. If you brush, I don't even use toothpaste. I just brush with a brush um, to get rid of the like the webs in there, the films on the teeth and bacteria can sort of live in that, but I don't use any toothpaste. There's so many chemicals in toothpaste. Um, Stay warm. I like to stay warm. It improves blood viscosity. It thins your blood. I think that's part of why a lot of old people like to retire south. Um, stress management. Learn to manage your stress. If you're having trouble with that, read about it because stress is a significant deal. Get your sleep. You know, I got a lecture on that. And, and make sure you've worked out a routine. You can sleep adequately, whatever you need to do. Uh, I recommend eating organic food. There's a lot of uh, estrogenic type herbicides in non-organic food. So if you've got high levels of estrogenics, they're going to predispose you to being fat, which predisposes you to being hypertensive and diabetic. So you want to try to minimize, and also increasing your risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer. So you want to minimize your estrogenics. I got a bunch of lectures on that, and that's easy to learn. You just got to, you know, put a week or two of your reading time into doing that. And also, how do you read a book? My advice, because I know tons of people, they all tell me, oh, I'm too busy, I can't read, I'm too busy. Put the book in the bathroom. Every time you go into the bathroom, always read at least a page, okay? When you take a number one, you know, read one page. If number two, read at least two pages. You know, I looked at Monty Python's skit, every sperm is sacred. I said, well, you know, every piss is sacred. I'm always going to read. I don't go into my bathroom without reading something. And I've noticed that I'll read I'll read at least a book a week just doing that. And I'll read a couple other books, audiobooks in the car, and other chances I get to read. So if you just do it that way, get a little bit here, a little bit here, you can read a lot of those. So make sure you learn about the things that are important to your health. And then have a whole house carbon filter because that removes all these estrogenic chemicals. Avoid putting these estrogenic chemicals on yourself. Bonfire the vanity is just a joke that throw all that stuff out. If you don't need it, throw it out. Like I said, you don't need de de deodorants on your armpit. We just say, hi, how you doing? We don't sniff each other's armpits. And when you start minimizing all these risk factors, each one by itself will be a tiny difference. You don't notice it. But you do a whole bunch of these things, all of a sudden you'll notice uh, dramatically improved health. There's a good chance you will. Okay. Um, Oh, and this is just a funny thing like Esselstyn, you know, is he flexible? No, he's not flexible. He's written in stone. No oil, no uh, nuts. Um, so anyways, all right. Well, I hope that was helpful. Good luck to you with uh, improving your health.